It's my good pleasure to uh, have the opportunity to introduce our speaker this morning. Many of you know her very well. She's a woman who has spent time working for InterVarsity and uh, has spent time with Native American peoples. She has a keen voice, or a keen ear rather, for the voices of those who are marginalized. And uh, Hillary Davis is a person that sojourned among us. And um, ask her about her, um, her summer. Ask her where she was this summer. She spent time in China. She's got stories to tell. And she is a storyteller. So let me invite up to our pulpit this morning, Hillary Davis. Yeah, no, I'm not Hillary. Um, no. Should I stay here? Should I just tell her? <laughs> I'm the reader. I'm the reader. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> if you have your Bible, John chapter 7. John chapter 7. I'll be reading from verse 45 into chapter 8, verse 11. <clears throat> this is the word of the Lord. Finally, the temple guards went back to the chief priests and Pharisees who asked them, why didn't you bring him in? No one ever spoke the way this man does, the guards declared. You mean he has deceived you also? The Pharisees retorted. Has any of the rulers or, or of the Pharisees believed in him? No, but this mob that knows nothing of the law, there is a curse on them. Nicodemus, who had gone to Jesus earlier and who was one of their own number, asked, does our law condemn anyone without first hearing him to find out what he is doing? They replied, are you from Galilee? Look into it and you will find that a prophet does not come out of Galilee. Then each went to his own home. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. At dawn, he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such woman. Now, what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, If any one of you is without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. This is the word of the Lord. I need to start by acknowledging this story. A uh, well-known passage of the woman caught in adultery is a contested pericope that people have not wanted to include in the canon because it violated um, first century purity obsession um, <clears throat> in the early church. But along with the apostolic father Papias in 125, the canon itself as it stands, and many good scholars, I agree that this story is very much in keeping with what we know of the character of Jesus. So if you're one of these folks that is not sure about this passage, I ask you to willingly suspend your disbelief and take a ride with me into the heart of Jesus. In 2006, I attended my first Urbana missions conference as a student, and I heard a talk there that I will never forget by Sharon Cohn, who was a lawyer at the International Justice Mission in Southeast Asia. She told us a story about Elizabeth, a girl from an ethnic minority who was sold into sex slavery just after completing 10th grade. 
Elizabeth wanted to die and thoughts of suicide came to her mind, but she prayed and asked God to rescue her before her first year in the brothel was up. After telling us more of Elizabeth's story, Sharon Cohn asked the question, as Elizabeth cries out for a rescue, what do we imagine happens next? How does God mobilize his people to answer Elizabeth's prayer? Becoming the answer to one another's deepest prayers, it's what Jesus did. He became the answer to humanity's deepest prayer in his incarnation. But I also believe that we as the body of Christ, his hands and his feet, his heart and his pulse, his central nervous system and his gut instincts in the world, we must become a living, breathing answer to one another's prayers. We like imagining how God might mobilize his people to answer the prayer of someone who's obviously innocent like Elizabeth, easily understood to be a simple victim. With her, we cry out to God for a rescue, and we begin to ask what we could do to help answer her prayer. We vow to become missionaries, international justice workers. We want to save those who obviously deserve saving. But what about when the situation is a little bit more complex? What about a morally ambiguous person? What about when the person praying is a Black Lives Matter protester after yet another brother has been shot who intersperses her desperate prayers for a cease to violence in her community with obscenities about the police? Are her prayers legitimate? What about when the person praying is a Muslim when the Somali immigrant who, last week in Kansas, asked God to protect him from the white supremacist group, the Crusaders, who recently tried to bomb his home? Or what about when the person praying is gay? When he finds the concept of lifelong celibacy beyond daunting and is begging God for a lasting sense of family? When our thoughts about the spiritual status of a person closer to home are mixed, our moral instincts in response to their cries often become mixed and even faltering. But as we look at today's passage, I want us to consider the question, what was the prayer of the woman caught in adultery? And how did Jesus respond to it? Now, we already know that Jesus was taking a big risk to show up to the temple this day, the Sabbath after the Feast of Sukkoth. As we know from the story, just the day before, the Pharisees had tried to arrest him, but he was too popular with the crowd. He spent the night praying on the Mount of Olives, and then, by some instinct, he moves right back into the heart of the danger. Now, which of us, after having almost gotten arrested the day before, would march straight back to the scene the next day, sit down and engage in the exact same activity that almost got you killed the day before? What motivated Jesus? As he prayed through the, Mount of, prayed through the night on the Mount of Olives, did he sense that this woman in that very same moment was terrified as she got caught? Now, the interaction in this story between Jesus and the Pharisees, the writing in the sand, the forgiveness of the woman, is often preached about as Jesus' strong critique of moral hypocrisy. Let he who is without sin cast the first stone. And rightly intuiting that we may be the Pharisees in this story are sent to consider the speck in our own eyes before judging that in another's. Sober self-judgment is an important moral of the story. But today, I want us to consider the story through the perspective of this woman's animal fear. Close your eyes for a minute. Actually do it, please. Close your eyes. And I want you to try to feel this woman's shame. Feel her despair. Did she even have a prayer? Or was her only feeling fear on the brink of damnation? Or did she have a quiet, voiceless prayer? Help! And did the Holy Spirit leaping inside Jesus hear and respond to that silent prayer? You can open your eyes now. 
Jesus knew this woman was a prop in a struggle by teachers of the law for religious power. They felt threatened by his popularity and his moral authority. Jesus, who made bald claims to reinterpret the laws of the Sabbath and who seemed to interact with Gentiles willy-nilly, yes, this woman was an adulteress. And we know Jesus takes that accusation seriously because he says, go and sin no more. And because he implicitly agrees that her punishment should be stoning. But that obvious question of where's the man caught in the act of adultery when Levitical law demanded that both be put to death points to the fact that this was obviously a setup. Her life was clearly deemed more dispensable for their theological trap. The fact is, we don't know if the adulterer may have been a Pharisee who bought the silence of his peers by colluding with this scheme. We don't know the degree to which this act of adultery was consensual. Was the woman pressured? Was she desperately trying to escape an abusive marriage? Was the accusation of adultery an easy way for her husband to divorce her, as is often the case in this time period? We don't know. What we do know in this story is that she has no voice. In first century Hebrew culture, she could not be a legal witness in her own trial. And I think many of us have had the experience of knowing that our word will not count for as much as another's, whether because of our race, our gender, our disability, our age, our marital status, our sexual orientation, or our nation of origin. We all know what it's like to be caught in sin but don't we also know shame, humiliation, and the feeling of absolute helplessness in the face of powers greater than ourselves? Don't we know what it feels like to be the butt of a cruel joke, the object of another's unfettered lust, or the target of someone's burning anger? And I'll pause and say that if you don't know what that feels like, you have lived a very blessed life. <laughs> I, I know that feeling more than I wish I did. Three and a half years ago, before coming to Gordon-Conwell, I got out of an emotionally abusive relationship with someone with whom I'd been engaged. And I will be the first to admit that it was a morally complex relationship. It was my mistake to stay in the relationship as long as I did. But afterwards, what hurt the most was the fact that when I expressed my concern about his explosive anger problem to church leaders, they didn't take me seriously. I guess nobody wanted to confront a valued guitar player on the worship team. <laughs> now, my situation was tame compared to other women I know who have been in abusive marriages or have been sexually assaulted by men at their churches. I know women whose pastor's first instincts have been to blame the victim and try to orchestrate a Matthew 18 reconciliation meeting with the abuser which is incredibly re-traumatizing. Folks, if you are ever pastors of local churches, please do not do this. Oh. <laughs> I was lucky to get out before things got worse, but the response of the church to my pain taught me pretty effectively the feeling of being dispensable. I've never felt further from God than when I felt unprotected by his church, and I've never come closer to losing my faith. But back to the story. Jesus has shaken up a crowd and ticked off some first century head pastors. He's come back for round two. They bring a theological trap to him in the form of a woman. And that's where they make their fatal mistake. They believe it's a simple case of damned if you do, damned if you don't legalism. Either Jesus is going to disobey Roman law, denying the Jews capital punishment jurisdiction and order her killed, or he refutes the law of Moses. Pretty great trap. But their fatal flaw is not realizing that Jesus' instincts are always to protect people. He does not see a theological question before him. He sees a woman. And his verbal response and his silent sand writing is a brilliant counterattack to get them off her back. And then he stands up and faces her, human to human. 
And before he tells her to go and sin no more, he asks her a question. Woman, where are your accusers? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir. I think Jesus wants her to hear that in her own voice, that no one has condemned her. I've been taught by counselors that counselors who study trauma specifically, that after a traumatic event, it's very important um, that a person tells their story and is believed. That's the single most important factor in whether someone can recover quickly after trauma is whether they are heard and believed. And there's three questions that you're supposed to ask them. One, what happened? Two, how did you feel? Three, what was the worst thing about that for you? I'm going to repeat that because this is really important for pastoral ministry. One, what happened? Two, how did you feel? Three, what was the worst thing about that for you? Because when a person is heard and believed, their recovery time is significantly curtailed. And though Jesus' conversation with the woman in this passage is an abbreviated form of those questions, I believe that in essence what he's doing is hearing and believing her as she begins to speak again. Because what Jesus does after life leaves us silenced, is he teaches us to articulate the truth. He does this for several women in scripture, specifically. We know from four chapters earlier in his interaction with the Samaritan woman that Jesus believes in the word and witness of women because he sent the Samaritan widow out as his first witness. And of course, we also know that Mary Magdalene serves as the first witness to the resurrection. So... However guilty the woman in our story may have been, it must have been incredibly traumatic to be removed from someone's bedroom, dragged through the center of town to a very public temple arena, and only to await in total terror her inevitable and incredibly painful death. But Jesus untraumatizes her. They don't condemn you, you say. Well, I don't either. And after all, he's the only one with the moral authority to seal the deal on her unexpected freedom. Finally, go and sin no more. I believe the progression in this dialogue is important. Jesus does correct her sin, but he does so only after protecting her and freeing her. Because Jesus responds to hurt people with the instincts of a mama bear, He rises up to defend our human dignity when it's under attack. And he knows that protecting people comes at a cost. He knows the stones this woman has evaded today aren't just going to fall on the ground and hang out there. These stones have names and they have blood to pay. Guilt, condemnation, terror, pain, betrayal, embarrassment, desperation, and an endless pile of unfulfilled human longing. When Jesus says, neither do I condemn you, he knows the law of Moses is not thereby rendered inert. He knows quite well that the consequence for adultery is death, and he knows that in that moment of letting her go, he is predicting his own death sentence. He is taking every single one of those stones. But by shielding this woman from the Pharisee stones and putting his own body in between them and her, he creates a protected space in which this woman can experience grace. Family, we need to get inside Jesus' instincts. Because it's not like Jesus didn't like theology. We know he spent about 18 years of his life doing theological thinking before he was deployed in ministry. And Jesus had the spirit of Isaiah 42.3, the prophecy of the suffering servant. A bruised reed he will not break. A smoldering wick he will not snuff out. In faithfulness he will bring forth justice. When Jesus comes across something broken, something barely there, something kind of pathetic, something riddled with moral depravity even, his instinct is to protect it from total extinction. And I believe that the spirit of the paraclete, the advocate, who comes and makes a home with us, 
will cause this mama bear instinct to rise up in us to protect our own. And who are our own, if not the poor in money, the poor in political power, the ones to whom Jesus said the kingdom belongs? Friends, in cases of moral ambiguity, do we have Jesus' instincts to protect before we correct them? Do we have the instincts to do whatever it takes to defend a person caught in the trap of her culture's politics, which would strip her of dignity? Or in the fight, flight, or freeze response, are we quick to peace or freeze out? And church, I'm not saying we always fail, but I am saying that with particular kinds of people, we have seriously failed to protect before we correct. We say, we need to make sure we have a correct theological statement about homosexuality on our church website so we can know how to handle gay people when they show up. Instead of saying, we need to make sure we create a safe space from bigotry so that together, we and our gay brothers and sisters in Christ can hash out our theological statement. We send missionaries to the Muslim world over there, and we may even invite Muslim friends to our Bible studies because we want them to have a correct relationship to God. But do we do anything to combat the rampant, vicious slander and anti-immigrant rhetoric happening against them in our country right now? Because there is nothing more unjust than failing to provide access to the grace of God because the way the church stripped people of dignity. By correcting first, the only experience of church we've left so many with is accusation. I say this not as someone immune to the condemning instinct. It is very native to me. My instinct is often to correct before protecting dignity. But I also stand here as someone who spends a lot of time cleaning up the messes of the church among Native people. Indigenous peoples were so abusively corrected by the missionaries who swept in on the coattails of conquerors that to this very day, at Standing Rock in North Dakota, hundreds of tribes are peacefully demonstrating just to try to protect what almost no church has ever done for them, which is simply protecting the viability of life on their land. This week, 400 water protectors who were peacefully offering prayers were arrested by rent-a-cops, many of them, no doubt, good Christians. Generation after generation, immigrant American Christians have been quick to correct Native people's beliefs, their dress, their hair length, their language, their food, their definition of family, their politics, their relationship to the land, and their creator, our creator, without any protection against enslavement, genocide, and theft. And I have to point out that when our instinct is to, is to correct before protecting, we're just we're often just confused about what needs correcting. I mean, hair length does not need correcting, folks. It just doesn't need correcting. 500 years in, the mess created by correcting before protecting is no joke. And I don't think we're likely to make this mistake with children. We all know instinctively that you need to protect a child before correcting them. We just know that if we're good caregivers. And I would argue that we should treat adults much the same. Because it's tough to go and sin no more if you're just not safe. If no one's got your back. Because like Ephesians 6 tells us, there is a war against us. And it's not of flesh and blood. It's by the rulers and the authorities the principalities and powers, the image of God in this woman in the passage is attacked by the rulers of a patriarchal society as well as the onslaught of temptation and despair. And today, that same systematic attack on the image of God is being deployed against each one of us. There is a systematic attack on the image of God waged against Alison Gerber. There is a systematic attack on the image of God waged against Dr. Isaac. There is a systematic attack on the image of God waged against Soleimani. Serious, folks. 
but God has a plan for countering this attack, for protecting Soleimani, for protecting Dr. Isaac, for protecting Allison Gerber, and I believe he wants to do it through Diana. He wants to do it through Katie, through Abby, through my mother, Robin Davis. He wants to protect each community we represent through each other. And I know this because it was through a patchwork of family members and friends, many of you in this room, who heard me and believed me and who restored my sense of dignity, that Jesus healed me to the point where I could go and sin no more, where I could obey his command to forgive. And I am still on that journey. One thing I love about Jesus in this passage is that he protects the dignity of the woman, but he also protects the dignity of the Pharisees. He does not just, he doesn't watch them go away in shame, and he doesn't argue with them. He keeps his head down. He seems to be wordlessly saying, I know you're better than this. He creates a world in which the Pharisee and the woman alike have their humanity restored. He creates a kingdom in which a Pharisee and a woman could defend each other's dignity. I see that Jesus instinct in Miles Allard, a 68-year-old Ojibwe elder. <clears throat> At Standing Rock this week, he negotiated a truce between enraged water protectors and equally enraged armed police. He risked his life to defend not just the dignity of his own native youngsters, but the dignity of the police who were threatening to hurt his people. Speaking about both sides, he said, I didn't want anybody to get killed. That would have broken my heart. If we use violence, we will lose. The only way to win is by prayer. Just as Jesus knew the dignity of the Pharisees was at stake, in their life and death games, Miles Allard saw something in the police officers that could be better, and he called both sides back to their better selves. And that Jesus instinct to rise up and defend the dignity of unlikely others is exactly what is so amazing about the body of Christ. Sarah Shin, a Korean American uh, who's at seminary this year, Realize that the way white people are talked about in reconciliation, racial reconciliation conversation, is often just totally negative, like, oh, you terrible white people walk away with white guilt, that's all you get. And she felt like that was not the gospel. And so Sarah is working to articulate a redemptive white identity. There are other people in our midst, men like Drew Brown, who recognize that they have power to speak up for women in the church, more than someone like I can, frankly, and they commit to doing so. I honestly did not expect that prayer to get answered at seminary. <laughs> Andrew Marin, a straight married guy, moved into a predominantly gay neighborhood in Chicago to build bridges between the church and the LGBTQ com community. He stands at gay pride parades with a sign that says, I'm sorry for the sins of my church. And I believe that each of these people and each of you who improbably fights to protect the dignity of someone with whom you have no mutual interest, no natural interest, you do what only the instincts of Jesus can do. Jesus identified in some wordless way with the woman caught in adultery. He heard her prayer. He saw her dignity underneath her shame. Her story became his own. And as we identify with the shame and hurt of our brothers and sisters, our lives will take on a cruciform structure. Throwing ourselves into the fray this way requires radical trust in the body of Christ. Because if I'm going to spend my life trying to fight for Tina's people, I have to trust that maybe Frank is going to spend his life advocating for mine. And because Jesus' instincts are good, 
because Jesus, who is in us, is courageous, because his spirit lives in our brothers and sisters, we can trust that our deepest wordless prayers will indeed be answered. Amen.